welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. This is a 7 inch mini lathe. This design is usually attributed to the Zeeg Model C2 and is available all over the world under many different brand names and sometimes unbranded. As far as I can tell, this one was manufactured by Realbull Machine Tool Company in China. It was sold unbranded as part of a very cheap batch and based on the number of problems it has I'm guessing it was a batch that failed quality control. I bought it because I get a lot of comments asking how the Proxon compares with cheaper Chinese lathes and I was curious to find out. I unboxed it and tested it out in an earlier video and found a lot of problems, so the best next step looked like stripping the lathe down into parts, cleaning it thoroughly and finding all the problems that need to be corrected before it can be used safely. The first time the lathe's powered up it makes this horrible rattling noise with no obvious signs of where it's coming from. The first obvious thing to remove is the chuck. It's held on by three threaded studs through the spindle plate and held in place by three nuts which can be removed with an ordinary spanner or wrench. The back of the chuck doesn't look right at all. The mechanism is completely exposed, which is great if you want to see how a scroll chuck works, but means it'll get clogged with chips. A chuck should be completely sealed at the back, like this chuck from the Proxon lathe. This will need to be fixed if the chuck is going to work reliably. The next obvious things to remove are the tailstock and the carriage. The tailstock should just slide off this end of the bed, but I'll need to remove this screw first. It looks like there's some paint spatter on the screw and the surface of the bed, which is probably from where the paint was touched up after the lathe was assembled. The splash guard is obstructing access to the carriage, so I'm removing that next. The most difficult screw to get to is this one on the underside at the headstock end. The next one is more obvious, on the other side just under the chuck. The final screw is right at the tailstock end. I'm not likely to reinstall the splash guard as it gets in the way of the camera when recording video and I film almost all the machining work I do. To remove the carriage I'm going to need to break it down into its three major components. The compound, the saddle and the apron. The compound needs to come off first and needs to be pulled all the way back to expose the two screws holding it in place on the saddle. The next two screws attach the saddle to the apron. Removing these will allow the saddle to move freely and slide off the end of the bed, leaving the apron engaged with the feed rack and lead screw. The saddle sticks a bit at the end of the bed. It looks like this is due to stray paint on the slideways, especially on the underside. Here I notice that the hold down plates on the saddle are at a strange angle. I'll need to look at this in more depth later. The only thing preventing the apron from coming loose is the half nuts. Even though it's disengaged, it still encloses the lead screw. To detach it, I'll need to remove the gib and allow the half nuts to come loose. The gib seems very poorly fitted. It turns out the holes for the gib screws don't line up correctly, so ideally would be replaced with a new gib with the correct alignment. The next thing I want to look at is the drive mechanism and feed gears. When I tested out the lathe it made a lot of noise and the spindle didn't turn properly. The first obvious problem is with this feed selection lever. It works fine in forward and reverse directions, but in the centre position it doesn't disengage properly. The range of movement where the gears are completely clear is very small and the lever's alignment is slightly off, meaning that the gears rattle and feed screw turns when it shouldn't. 
In addition, there's a lot of play in the lever mechanism, so even if the center detent was in the correct position, it still would probably not disengage reliably. To get a better look at this lever, I need to disassemble the gear train, so I'm going to start with the larger gears at the bottom. The screws are easy enough to remove, but the gears themselves are very firmly in place. As they're made of plastic, I'm very cautious about using too much force to remove them. Looking more closely at the lead screw gear, the plastic is cracked at the keyway. It looks as though they weren't fitted correctly. Removing them is almost certain to damage them further, so I'll need to buy replacements. I know that metal replacement sets are available, so I'll be on the lookout for one of those. Removing the screw on this central gear doesn't seem to make anything easier to remove, so I need to look for other options. While I can't easily remove the gears, loosening this nut allows them to be moved down, disengaging them from the gear above and making room for the rest of the mechanism to be removed. With the lower gears out of the way, this central mechanism can be removed in one piece by removing these two screws. The feed direction lever is now completely exposed and only held in place by this last screw. With the top part of the gear train removed, I should be able to get to the drive mechanism by removing this panel. When the lathe's turned on, the spindle turns, but it makes a loud noise when it's under any load. Now that the belt's exposed, it's clear that it's way too loose and slips very easily. The belt goes directly to the spindle from the motor, but I can't see the motor clearly without removing more of the casing. The chuck guard cutoff switch is in the way of removing the motor cover, so that looks like the right place to start. It's straightforward to remove by taking out the two screws holding the switch in place and the four screws holding the conduit. The top two screws of the motor cover are now easy to get to and remove. The final screw holding the cover in place is in the bottom corner. Once the cover's removed, we can see that the motor is loose, which would explain why the belt isn't tightened properly. The motor mounting and all the wiring are on the other side of the bed casting. On the other side of the lathe, everything is covered by this control panel casing, so that needs to come off. It's held on by four screws, and removing the bottom two first avoids the case falling off unexpectedly. The power cord wires connect through these two terminals, so I need to disconnect them before the casing can be removed. The final earth connection of the cord is screwed into the headstock casting on the control panel side.
With the cover out of the way, the motor can be temporarily wedged into the correct place using a bit of scrap wood, but this obviously isn't a good permanent fix. The belt pulley is held in place by a single screw, but once the screw is removed, it's firmly in place enough to need to be prized off. Now everything is out of the way that we can see that the motor mounting studs are loose and look bent. The reason this has happened is they're much too small for the mounting holes in the bed casting, and only the very edges of the washers are in contact with the face, making it very easy for them to bend. Washers should be clamped between parts, not stretched across a gap like this. While the lathe is on its side is a good time to remove the lead screw, which is fixed by hanger bearings here at the head. And here at the tail of the lathe. This plastic shield looks like it's there to keep the wiring clear of the lead screw. Mustn't lose these two washers, which were between the motor and the bed casting. The next major stage is removing the headstock, which is held on by four screws. I didn't get any footage of removing the screws on the far side, so here's footage of screwing them back in, played in reverse. Under the headstock there's a load of that mixture of oil and grinding grit which needs to be cleaned off most of the lathe. The last part still fitted to the bed is the feed rack. The screws look as though the heads have been ground until they're flat with the surface and there's barely any of the hex left to engage with. I only managed to turn this screw a little before the hex was entirely stripped so I decided to skip removing the rack for now. The layer of gritty grime dissolves away easily in WD-40, but once it's been wiped away it's a lot more clear how much paint spatter there is towards the tailstock end. Water-based paint stripping gel should make it easy to remove the spatter without the need for any sharp scraping tool which might damage the ground surface. While I'm waiting for the stripper to take effect, I also want to remove the paint from the points where the lead screw hanger bearings are mounted. This will make sure there's metal-to-metal -metal contact, which will ensure the feed is as rigid as possible. The paint layer on this part of the bed is thick, so plenty of gel is required to strip it. After a few minutes to dissolve, the paint spatter wipes away easily with a rag and some WD-40 ensures no water from the gel is left behind. The paint layer on the bearing mounts are softened, but not enough to entirely remove it, so another layer of gel is required. After about 20 minutes, the paint is soft enough to be completely removed. To make sure there's no moisture left behind, I need to flush out the screw holes with WD-40 and compressed air. The next obvious place to clean is the rack. To dislodge dirt from between the teeth and between the rack and the bed, I use more compressed air.
Halfway along the rack I stumbled across this. It looks as though a filler material has been used to smooth the casting and a bump is obstructing the feed pinion that runs along the rack. To prevent the rubbing I need to file it away, using this Teflon shim to make sure the file doesn't damage the rack. The slideway on the other side of the bed is much easier to clean. The last remaining slideways on the bed are on the underside of the middle, which the tailstock hold-down plate grips. These turn out to be covered with a lot of paint, so I need more stripping gel. The webs of the bed make it very difficult to get to these ways and make it especially difficult to apply enough force to scrape away the paint properly. Eventually I get the ways completely cleared and wiped down with WD-40. The next problem with the bed are the burrs. All the ground faces have sharp edges and it feels like there are burrs in every corner. These burrs can cause contact surfaces to wear and are sharp enough to hurt if I rub against them. I need to make sure I don't damage the ground surfaces when removing the burrs, so I'm using a bench stone to abrade them smooth. For each edge I run the stone along at different angles to catch every part of the burr, but make sure the stone doesn't come into contact with the flat surfaces. Once the burr's gone, I smooth the corner with the finer grit side of the stone. The sides of the bed are not ground and not contact surfaces, so I'm stoning the faces more directly. The edges of the inner sides of the bed are much more difficult to get to, so I use a smaller stone. The under edges are more difficult still, so I'm using a very narrow abrasive stone and a lot of patience. To dress the ground faces I use this pair of fine diamond home stones. Ideally I would use a pair of precision ground flat stones, but they are very expensive for my little shop. Precision ground flat stones have been ground extremely flat using a diamond wheel and a surface grinder. This makes the force between the stone and a flat metal surface so low that the stone doesn't abrade the metal, ensuring only a very small protruding nicks and burrs are affected, leaving the rest of the face untouched. My diamond toned stones are a poor substitute, but with caution they allow me to clean ground flat surfaces without damaging them. The faces on the underside are machined but not ground, so I'm using a normal stone to smooth away some of the machining marks.
After all the deburring, the beds need a wipe down with WD-40 to remove the chips and any loose abrasive from the stones. The bed is now done, but there is still this big pile of other components to clean. The first parts to remove are the hold down plates from the saddle, which are attached by these three screws. Most of the carriage parts are small enough to go into the ultrasonic cleaner, which can thoroughly clean, degrease and remove any grit and abrasive from the parts at the same time. These three screws on the side hold the cross slide gib in place. Removing them should release the gib. The gib slides out pretty easily, but the cross slide is still held in place by the lead screw. The cross slide should just slide off the end of the saddle once the nut reaches the end of the screw. Winding the cross slide off the end of the travel turns out to be a lot easier with the handle reinstalled. The handle is attached to the end of the lead screw by this single cap head screw. The scale is held in place by a retaining screw. The last part of the crossfeed assembly is attached to the saddle by two screws at the bottom of these two holes. The saddle is now stripped down, but is still covered in gritty grime like most of the lathe. It's much too big to fit into my small ultrasonic cleaner, so I'll need to clean it the same way as I cleaned the bed. The final thing to remove are the plastic wipers. These wipers are intended to prevent swarf and chips from getting between the saddle and the ways. They also help keep whey oil where it belongs. I'm unsure how well this black plastic style of wiper works and I'm considering replacing them with felt wipers, which I've seen on most professional lathes I've used. The last part to remove from the cross slide is the feed screw nut. It's held straight by these two screws. All the small parts now go in the ultrasonic cleaner. I'm using bike chain cleaner as a degreaser as it's much easier to get hold of than specialist ultrasonic cleaning fluid. I dilute it with boiling water as ultrasonic cleaners work better when the solution is warm, but this cheap little cleaner doesn't have its own heater. Once the cycle is run, I remove the parts from the obviously much dirtier degreasing solution, shaking loose any debris which has been dislodged by the ultrasonic cleaning process. I empty the parts onto tissue to dry and rub off any external moisture. I then use compressed air to remove moisture from the holes and inner surfaces. Once they're dry, I move the parts onto a fresh tissue and spray it with WD-40 to prevent corrosion and displace the last remnants of moisture.
The larger parts need to be cleaned the same way I cleaned the bed, using WD-40 and a cloth. This is quite a lot more work than the bed as the shape is more complex and there are more difficult to reach places where grit could get lodged. Once they're clean, I deburr the parts with a stone, just the same way as I deburred the bed. These two flat surfaces are where the hold down plates are mounted. They have some raised edges around the tapped holes and some rough machining marks, so I stone them more aggressively. Before dressing the ground sliding surfaces, I clean off the swarf and free abrasive by wiping the parts down with more WD-40. To reach the insides of the dovetail ways, a triangular stone is required, so I'm honing down the faces of this triangular stone so I can use it to remove fine burrs and dings, the same way I use a pair of diamond honed stones on the surfaces of the bed. After a few passes, the sound of the stone changes to a softer sliding tone, which I think means the stone is no longer cutting metal. I can clean the exposed slideways with the same pair of diamond tone stones that I used before. The toolpost provided with the lathe is already lined up to be replaced with the much more useful cuneiform gib toolpost. The review video is quicker to make than this one, so I uploaded it a few weeks ago. The next part I'm most keen to replace is this cheap looking plastic angle scale. I'm determined to replace this with something less chintzy, so I'm never going to put this one back on. The gib retaining screws work just the same way as on the cross slide.
All the compound parts will fit into the ultrasonic cleaner, so I'll clean it that way, then deburr in the same way as the saddle. The compound slide is already wound to almost to the end, so it comes apart easily. While the handle is attached the same way as the cross slide, the rest of the assembly looks a lot more clumsy. These two nuts are locked together and seem to act as a spacer between the handle and the scale. The scale is held by this retaining screw and is the only thing left holding the lead screw in position. This last part held on by two screws is little more than a spacer and a reference point for the scale. Cleaning and deburring was exactly the same as the saddle, so I won't bother showing it here. The final disassembly is the tailstock. The bottom plate is held onto the main body by this single cat screw, undone from the underside. There are two retaining screws on the side which lock the horizontal position, but they are already loose. Removing this retaining screw releases the locking lever and allows the locking mechanism to slide clear. It's a bit gummed up with paint, but eventually works free. The quill lock handle comes off easily by unscrewing it, leaving this bushing in the hole. The quill can now be extended until it runs off the end of the lead screw and is free. The bushing isn't fixed in place, but it's hard to get a grip on to remove it. The central stud for the locking mechanism is just screwed into the casting. Now everything's removed, I can see that the locking bushing also acts as a key to hold the quill straight, which feels a bit kludgy. The feed wheel is held on by this retaining screw on the side, and also by a knot on the end of the spindle shaft. The shaft is held in place by this ring, which is fitted with two cap screws. Most of the parts go into the ultrasonic cleaner, but the casting is too large and needs to be cleaned separately. The paintwork cleans up okay, but the bottom mounting surface is quite a mess. It's covered in rough machining marks and is very corroded. This surface really needs to be remachined, but at this point I don't know how much material I have to play with, so I look at doing this once the machine is back together, and I can try and see whether the tailstock can be made to align with the spindle. This is the underside of the base, which rests on the bed, but unlike the saddle, there's no sign of any ground surfaces, so I don't worry too much about staining the burrs carefully. The 
top side of the base is where the main body of the tailstock rests, so I need to clear up this paint to make sure of a good contact. I didn't bother with stripping gel though, as the paint's soft and scrapes away easily. The overall quality of the tailstock is so bad I'm not even sure it's recoverable, but I'm going to keep working on it for now, as it's part of the lathe package. The whole lathe has now been disassembled, and most of it's cleaner than it was. This video has already gotten longer than I planned, so the reassembly will be the next chapter of the story in a video of its own. This video took me a while to make, and I know a lot of you are waiting, so thank you all for your patience. The assembly video is already in production, and shouldn't take quite as long. I also have some machining projects and tool reviews in the pipeline, so I'll see you all soon.